Hey, we want to say thank you to our sponsors, Watchman Cigars, Red Hill Brewing, Crave Bath and Body, and Level Up Logo. Without you guys, this episode would not be possible. Buongiorno! Welcome to the Italiano Fried Philosophy Podcast. I am your host, Bigano. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fresh back from Italy. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the Southern Fried Philosophy Podcast. It's our take on life, liberty, and the pursuit of gravy. While you, the listener, are invited to come up on the front porch, grab a beverage, and set a spell. We've got a great show lined up for you, as always. Uh, this week, we have Jeff Holsclaw. He is pastor, podcaster of God With Us and Embodied Faith, and the author of um, uh, prodigal Christianity, Does God Really Like Me, and Transcending Subjects. He is going to be on the show later this uh, this evening or th this morning, whenever you may be listening. Um, but uh, we have started a new, new series in the pursuit of deconstructing church and faith. So you'll be wanting to stick around for that. If you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, it'll all be good stuff. Uh, but before we begin, let me introduce you to our crew. Say, what up, Magic Man? What up? <laughs> hey, Aaron. Hello. I was going to say, what's up? <laughs> what up? <laughs> what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> like 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the show. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and producer Brian. Hey, guys. How's it going? Uh, Aaron, where can people find us on the socials? Uh, you can find us on um, Instagram and Twitter. It's SFP Radio. Um, on YouTube, we are Southern Fried Philosophy. Um, check out our uh, new and improved website. Um, you can find all of our links on there. You can contact us. Um, leave a review. Five stars, please. Um, and you can donate to the show on there. There you go. You can also leave us a voicemail. We'd appreciate that. I was going to say that. Yeah, leave us a voicemail. That, that's clearly working well. Again, <laughs> I don't know what to do to you move You can tell us. Uh, uh, we should do it. Um, the one where like people, you know, they confess their secrets. We should do that. Uh, I would love that. That would be yeah, great. Leave us a voicemail. Just, confess something. I don't know. Just not a crime. <laughs> completely but, anonymous. Like, you, know, you don't have to leave your oh, name. Yeah. You want to just tell if us you, something? Don't tell us who you are. Yeah. If you've committed a murder, you can just tell <laughs> us. It'd be like your priest. Don't. <laughs> I don't want to be burdened with that information. <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh, uh, Aaron, I was listening to the last show, by the way. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of everybody stepping on each other, which is fine. There's latency with, with uh, doing it on the web. But you made a comment that was fantastic. And you guys were talking about <clears throat> White Castles, you know, the little mini burgers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And, and then somebody said they're going to slide down and then it paused for a second. And then Aaron, you said down the toilet. <laughs> no, I said, no. That was perfect. Cause that's what happens, I, man. You eat those little white castle burgers and Hey buddy, they go crazy. Um, hey, so again, we started a new series in the pursuit of deconstructed Christianity. Next week we have Jeremy Coleman. He is that pastor from Oklahoma. He is on TikTok. He's got 295,000 followers. But more importantly, he has a great story and a message uh, talking about his struggle with uh, the American church and kind of what he's doing now. But it's, uh, it's a fantastic story. So he's going to be on next week. We want to say shout out to all our listeners from Michigan. Ryan, tell us our folks, tell, tell our listeners about some interesting facts about Michigan. Sure thing. So the first thing is Michigan translates to if you seek a, seek a pleasant, uh, let me try that again. Cause like I completely garbled up my words there. <laughs> if, if you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. And okay. What? Um, that's, that's like funny. a native American translation or something. Yeah, what is that? That's not probably, more, probably way, there was way more letters and it's not a good, uh, what do you, what's the acronym, right? Use not, use yeah. all the wrong letters for the acronym. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. All right. Uh, so P 
people from the upper peninsula, sometimes the people from the lower peninsula trolls because they live under the bridge, meaning the, oh, I'm going to blow this up. <laughs> Mackinac Bridge. I think it's, it's, I don't think that's how you're supposed to pronounce it. But anyways, you get that. Oh, Our listeners right. from Michigan uh, are loving this right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, at least I admitted I was I was uh, butchering the, the Mackinac Bridge. That's how you're supposed to say. Ah, oh, I that. Yeah. Yep. 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 All right. Um, a weird law in Michigan prevents pigs from running free in the downtown area of Detroit. This is, of course, unless they have a ring in their nose, in which case they are free to run. Hmm. Just, mm. Don't do it. Don't do it. All right. There's some jokes there. Just, uh, yep, just don't. <laughs> Yeah, you saw that face. <laughs> I had the same one in my head, probably. So, <laughs> so uh, this one is is in honor of of Aaron being our our uh, resident hairstylist here. One of the weirdest laws in Michigan is a law declaring that a woman is not allowed to cut her own hair unless her husband tells her that she is allowed. What? Uh, yeah, I ain't touching that one. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes sense, so, right? Makes sense. No. <laughs> Kidding. Kidding. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> so the next episode, we're going to be talking about uh, women's rights. <clears throat> I guess we're going down that route. It was just International Women's Day. It was. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> Good job. Congrats. Yeah, great. Way to go. <laughs> Congratulations. Celebrate, celebrate the girl power. Yeah. It's all about. Look, let's be honest. Right. They have way more power than men do. There's no doubt. We couldn't run nothing without women. True. Nothing. Facts. True. What what was it? What was it they said on what was that movie? The My Big Fat Greek Wedding. The man may be the head of the household, but the woman is has the power to turn the head. Mm-hmm. Mm. I thought that was a good thing. But anyways. All right, uh, last one. <laughs> Another law is that men are not allowed to scowl at their wives in the city of Detroit. Hmm. There you go. But they can make them not get a haircut. So that's, there's that. Mm. Well, only if she is, wants to cut her own hair. So I guess if someone wanted to go see Aaron, they could go on their own will. <laughs> okay. But, All right. Yeah. But if you want to cut I'm, your okay. own hair, perfect. You need yeah. permission. So if you want to break out the bowl with the scissors <laughs> <laughs> or the flow bee. The flow bee. Yes. The flow bee. <laughs> I need permission to get my own hair cut from my wife with what you know by myself or anybody else. So it works for me. She says, get your hair cut. I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to How You Be Durin by Crave Bath and Body. Listen, when I was out in Italy, I was missing my my bath soap. I didn't take it. I was just going to use the hotel stuff. Bad call. I miss it. I got back. I was glad to see my bed, my toilet, and my soap. I was thankful I had those things. So I miss my Crave Bath and Body. It's great stuff. Crave Bath and Body BB. Dot com go there get grab your soaps your bath bombs all the fun things uh yep. so i'm gonna ask you like i ask you every week magic man how you be doing be doing pretty darn good um well i guess i'll, I'll back up into uh, one of my old habits of we had an mm. interesting storm the other night talking about the weather <laughs> and um th- we had some some winds come through so uh for those who haven't listened to the last many episodes, uh, my wife and I are now living in a 41 foot long fifth wheel RV. And um, so there's really no, nothing tying us to the ground. Um, No, we didn't back up into the pond behind us or anything, but but, um, it's interesting when the winds blow hard enough, um, this, this RV goes a rocking and a rolling a little bit. And, and uh, we, we had, (laughs) <laughs> don't go there um, <laughs> <laughs> um and you said blame it on the winds yeah. <laughs> blame it on the winds that's right <laughs> so yeah it was it was uh we, we had a good bit of buffeting the other night and, and then um the thunder was pretty loud and, and so you know it was a little nerve wracking but uh you know no no damage everything's good 
And so, uh, I have a question for you, Ryan. Yeah. Do, do you plan on driving through Tornado Alley in the next couple months here? In your uh, rig? We, we are actually. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, no. Okay. That's <laughs> no. Short answer. That's but, <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're heading into Mississippi this weekend. Um, so we'll be in the Tupelo area for a couple weeks. And then we're heading to, to Vicksburg for a couple weeks. And then we're actually heading back east. We're going to uh, get into Georgia by the middle of April. Um, some have some business we need to take care of there. And then um, we'll actually be back up in the uh, Charlotte area uh, um, in May. And we're, and we're staying around in the Charlotte area for a couple months. Uh, you know, again, to take some biz, take care of some business, see uh, family and friends, mm. um, go to the beach with my parents, you know, that, all that kind of good stuff. So um, definitely, we'll, hopefully we'll all be able to get together uh, one of those those weeks that, that we're there and have fun uh, doing a podcast or drinking some bourbon or whatever. Absolutely. I, we'll probably have to do the Christmas party then because you won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. During Christmas, Chris, Christmas in June or Christmas in May. Yeah. That's right. May. Hey, perfect. <laughs> Aaron, how you been doing? I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. I I missed <laughs> Brian, but I've really like I really miss Brian. I'll be honest with you. Like when I was when I was gone, I was like texting him, and be like, "Hey, how you doing?" <laughs> and then I was like, "But then I see your face, and I'm like, I really missed Aaron." Uh, Aww. <laughs> Ryan, I just went over. I'm just kidding. I love you too, buddy. <laughs> you take love out you like a, a picture of Brian on your trip, like in <sighs> from your wallet. You just <laughs> it's like I'll fold it. <laughs> <laughs> just looking at it and just, just like, mm, what's going on over there? <laughs> what is going on over there? <sighs> yeah. Oh man, I love that. Uh, uh, Ryan, how you doing? Uh, can I tell you a sad story? Absolutely. No. So a little backstory here. Twix is probably one of my favorite candy bars. Okay. And I don't know if you know, over the last like three, four weeks, Krispy Kreme has had a Twix donut. It had like the Twix candy bar inside of the donut. And I've been seeing like advertisement for this thing for weeks and just haven't had a chance to get over there. Right. So this week, like yesterday, uh, my daughter had an early release day from school. Which is the dumbest thing in the world. I don't want to get to that though. Um, so I was like, all right, we're going to go get lunch and then go to Krispy Kreme and get one of these donuts because I know she'll like it and I really want it. My wife really wanted one. Mm-hmm. Roll up, mm-hmm. go inside, mm-hmm. looking around. I don't see any, you know, posters on the walls. I don't see any oh, no. Twix advertising. So I asked the guy, I said, did I miss the Twix donuts? He said, yeah, they were, we stopped selling them on Sunday, which was three oh, days before I got there. No. So no. It was, it was sad. Yeah. So explain the donut to me. Is it, is it just a regular donut with a Twix shoved in the middle of it? They had a couple of them. Essentially they had two different styles. There was the round one, like the, you know, straight up round yeah. donut, but like, you know how they fill them with cream. Uh-huh. This was filled with like a legit Twix bar. I need to pull up a picture and send it to you. But why don't you just make your own? Can you make your own Krispy Kreme? No, I mean get the Krispy no. Kreme. No, this is a Krispy then, Kreme. Don't and just stick a Twix in it and eat it. And just stick a Twix <laughs> in it. <laughs> well, that that might be what it comes Touch. down to. Uh, let me let me be honest with you. So when when we had Hot Pocket, I don't know if you guys remember this story or not, but he he wanted some Chick Fil A uh, chicken I, nugget or I like the strips. Story. And I wanted the donut. <clears throat> so we went through the Chick-fil-A line and then the, the right next to the Chick-fil-A sign or the Chick-fil-A was the Krispy Kreme. I went through and got, you know, six count of donuts <clears throat> and I got the chicken strip and put it in the middle, like a taco. Mm. It was the most incredible thing I ever had. Yeah. It was Sounds insane. Amazing. So you, if I can put a chicken strip in Krispy Kreme, you can put a Twix in there. Just shove it right in there. Especially if you get the, but if you even got like the chocolate cream and then shoved it in there, hey, buddy. Yeah. You're on something. I mean, I want to see this picture here because it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of, this tells the whole story, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's my sad story. Yeah. And the, oh, there's yeah. Twix on top too, like crumbled up okay. pieces. Well, this is, this is uh, diabetes on a plate. Sure. <laughs> no, I get it. It looks delicious. I won't lie. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Next time, just get on there. You got to get in there. You can't wait. Yeah, I thought I had till like the 11th, mm. which is as we record this is tomorrow. But mm-hmm. yeah. too late. You snooze, you lose. From what I've been told. Yeah. So they have chocolate, chocolate covered donuts starting tomorrow. Mm. So heads up. No, it's not okay. a big deal. But if they get around the line, I went through Krispy Kreme one time when they were doing lemon hot and nails. Okay. And, and I love lemon everything. It blew my mind. It was they were so good. I ate like a dozen mm. of them straight out of the box. <laughs> Atta boy. Yeah. What's the what's the number of donuts you could eat the hot and fresh out of the box? And that's this is for everybody. Oh. I mean, what what Aaron, what do I have to do you afterwards? Can, are you allowed to say? <laughs> you can't say it. No, nobody's going to judge. There's no judgment. Yeah. Um, I mean, it really depends. Okay, a good day, mm-hmm. like like four or five. Wow, you're shooting low. Like- so, can you eat more on a bad day? Is that? <laughs> Like I say, like a good day, like I'm really hungry. Like if I was like craving it, uh-huh. if I was like, I gotta have maybe like four, but I mean, four would probably honestly be the limit. Like I get mm. sugar is like <laughs> sometimes <laughs> too much. in the coma still trying to eat them. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Magic man. How many can you put down? No holds barred, no judgment. Of, yeah, I'm trying to think of, of probably I've done up to three or four. I'm not a big sweets person. I love Krispy Kreme, mm. don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I'm not a big sweets person. So after that, it's like it's just too much. Too much sugar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> too too mm. much sweet. But um one of our listeners um just put a comment on the chat it says smoke park belly and Krispy Kreme sandwich sounds good. Uh, Lee Short oh. said that. Oh, Mm. I can be down with that. Yeah. yeah. Producer yeah. Brian, how many can you eat? <clears throat> Here's the problem. So I think what happens is so you get hot nails, right? Straight right. in the box. As you eat them, they cool off. Now, if some if someone was constantly putting another hot one down, right. you're not really chewing. So you could just keep it's just like drinking a milkshake or something. You just keep going yeah. until but if you just like go buy your own and sit in the you know, you sit with three dozen in the restaurant and eat them. They're going to get cooler. And as they get cooler, right. there's more chewing. Right. Maybe I should have specified you're at the roller, right? And they're just okay. coming around. And I'm unsupervised. Unsupervised. And you're just, oh, you're just going at it. Oh, man. I mean, how many of those crank out per minute? That's really what's going to come down to. It doesn't matter. How many can you eat? I have no idea. I've never tried this. I mean, we should it's just be an I could just keep going until. Let's roll that would be awesome. Dude, that's I mean, Krispy Kreme. It would be bad. <laughs> yeah. I have to go somewhere after we this. figured out where our Christmas party is going to be at. Yeah. We're gonna, yeah. We're going to break into Krispy Kreme and start the hot and now machine. All right. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever Stick- watched the video of them making them? It's like so mesmerizing. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. It's, oh uh, yeah. It's just like it puts you in a trance. You're like <laughs> So yeah, uh, Lee in the chat says two hundred if he's at the roller. So yeah. <laughs> how many for you, Biggin? Awesome. What's what's the what do you think? Oh, you're... I could I could easily put down a dozen and not yeah. even think twice. Yeah. If they're hot, like if because they melt and it's just like yeah. you know, it's like cotton candy. You you really there's nothing there to it. So Agreed. anyway. Uh, so let me address, I know we're, we're running low on time. So let me address some of the issues that I had with last week's show. Uh, Uh, I was not here. Um, performance uh, review live on air. Here we go. Yeah. So, no, just some comments that I noticed. Uh, so, and they were mainly from Jim. So Wordle, you guys are anti Wordle. I love Wordle. It's great. I don't post my scores, but I play Wordle. Wordle. Um, that's the way to do it, though. That's the way to do it. Oh, okay. So don't you're post okay. your scores. You're pro playing. Yeah, I don't Wordle. care if you're you just... play Wordle. Just stop okay. posting your scores. I don't care. Okay. You know. All right. yeah, that no, takes us I, back I to like. That. Remember when first Facebook first came out, and I had all those games like Farmville and all that other yes. stuff, and all you yes. saw on your feed was people saying, you know, what this they did with their farm, their city, and stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just shuck some corn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Uh wine. So Jim wanted to know about wine. We we took the the Tuscany tour uh 
uh, Bor- Bornello, I think is probably the best that I had. Uh, we bought some of that to bring home. Um, we had some Chianti, uh, some fava beans and a nice bottle of Chianti. Uh, and, but I've never been, a uh, I've always been a bourbon guy. I've never been a wine guy, but drinking so much of it, you're like, man, this ain't bad. And then you start to like it and enjoy it. So, uh, to you, Jim, I say, I enjoyed the wine and it was great. And we brought some home. So there, um, <laughs> Also, we we thought we were doing something really special about bringing some candy home, and then I was at the old Harris Teeter, and I was like, "Oh, there's some right there." Well, <laughs> great. Um, and then Whataburger. Uh, I love Whataburger. It is phenomenal. I know you just tried it. You said it was a great burger. I would implore you to get the chicken finger sandwich put with the barbecue sauce, the onion ring on it. Also, don't skip on their breakfast because there's their breakfast is legit. Mm-hmm. Um, and last but not least, uh, why is Jim such a caulif- cauliflower lover? That you should have just kicked him <laughs> off the show when he said cauliflower rice. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What in the world's wrong with you, cauliflower? All right, that's that's my rant for the for the show last week. Um, <laughs> Trigger, Jess. It's triggered. Trigger warning, cauliflower. <laughs> yeah, call, it, he, he said it weird. I love Jim. Jim's great, but cauliflower is cauliflower. He says it weird, mm. right? He's a Yankee. It's all right. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So our Southern phrase of the week, a rooster <laughs> one day, a feather duster the next. This is our creative way of saying that you shouldn't crow like a rooster about your wealth or in belonging today because it could all disappear tomorrow. A rooster one day, feather duster the next. <clears throat> sometimes you're the bug, sometimes you're the windshield. Mm. So is that. Uh, all right, so let's go to Brian. You wanted to talk about a movie trailer. <laughs> what is this about? If we, if we have time for this, uh, so I saw a synopsis for a movie trailer yesterday that to me sounds like the best thing of the year already. Okay, let me find it for you. Uh, any uh, Nicolas Cage fans here? Oh, I love I love National Treasure more than I should. Right, just the first one, not he really made, the second. He made a couple of pretty good movies, right? Yeah. So, have you heard? There's a a uh, movie called The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I think that's a um, biography of my belt. <laughs> You're close. You're close. <laughs> So here's here's the synopsis, and this is what I think is amazing about this. Oh, Nicholas on, Cage, one, by the way. right, is playing yep. Nicholas Cage, <laughs> an actor enduring a career slump who is forced to take a million dollar job attending a wealthy super fan's birthday. And Nicholas Cage has to assume the identity of several classic Nicholas Cage characters, which are all real life Nicholas Cage characters because Nicholas Cage is playing the real Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Additionally, Cage will also play Nikki, a figment of his own imagination. <laughs> That's the movie synopsis. I watched the trailer this afternoon. I will I'm pay so money confused. to see this. song let's say. Uh, you will pay money to see yeah. it. But in the like the trailer sets it up like he's in a he's made a bunch of movies that no one's heard of in the last like three years because they're Which terrible. <laughs> so he's like playing himself in this movie and he gets paid to go to a birthday party and be like act like his characters. It's, it, I, don't know. Yeah. I think it's, it sounds great to me. All right, well, enjoy that. Yeah. Um, here's One here's. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, get um, Magic Man, set the over under for how many people you think are going to be in the movie theater while Brian is watching this movie. Five. Okay. <laughs> and that's I will, <laughs> I will go uh ooh, that's tough. I I'll go under. Mm. Aaron? Yeah, under. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. You think it's gonna be that bad? Pedro Absolutely. Pascal's in it. He's awesome. Why not? You know. I don't know. No. no? Mm. Man. No. Uh, well, Lee shorts guys, with me in the in the chat. He said, "Yeah, think you and great. Lee are the only ones that are going to be on the." In, I'm the fine thing. with that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All 
Well, uh, we don't have a ton of time, so let me um, let me kind of give you a brief synopsis of my trip, if that's if that's okay. <clears throat> Um, so before we even started to get on the flight, um, Biggin had an issue, uh, with a stomach virus and I didn't know if I was even going to go. And then my wife got it and we certainly didn't know if we were going to go. Um, and so the, the very last, probably ooh, 48 hours, we were questioning if we were getting on the plane or not, because who wants to be on a plane with stomach issues for 10 hours? Nobody. Right. So Luckily, I called uh, my doctor. You remember uh, Brittany? Uh, she was on last season. She told me to take some probiotics. That somehow cleared it up. And guys, I was popping Imodium AD like they were candy. And Imodium AD will stop a radiator leak, but they did nothing to my stomach. <clears throat> so it was it was pretty pretty rough. Uh, so we get on the flight. We go to Rome. Uh, we land that night, and then this quickly became: How do you think? Uh, or how big and will die trip um, <laughs> that night we we landed and then we decide we're going to explore Rome but we took a nap uh, got up and like hey let's go explore um, big and doesn't do a lot of walking so <laughs> so we're like all right well let's just go explore so we start walking uh, we go get dinner we go to the Trevi Fountain we have a good time no issues um, and we go back, but however, keep in mind that the streets are all cobblestone and, and Biggin, uh, doesn't walk very well, you know, quickly. So I've kind of like pace myself and watch it. So it was, it was, you know, uh, something I had to, to focus on just walking through the streets there. Um, the next day we went to, uh, the Vatican and, uh, St. Peter's. Um, again, the question was, how is Biggin going to die today? We walked six miles before noon. <laughs> six miles. I haven't walked six miles in my life. Um, so that was tough, but but I made it. At the end of the day, we had another tour scheduled. Luckily, that entire tour was on a golf cart. So I was oh, like, this is perfect. Nice. <laughs> yes. Oh, then the next day, we went to a pasta making class where um, it was on top of uh, this little – a hill. Well, it was a giant hill. I had to end up walking up 10 flights of stairs to get to this thing. So again, Biggin was going to die that day, uh, which by the way, the pasta making class was insane. It was perfect. Uh, producer Brian, Aaron, mm. you guys are going to come over. I'm going to make pasta for you. We're going to do this whole thing. It's going to be great. Um, and then, and then, th then we went to Florence, took a high speed train going 150 miles an hour. I thought my face was going to blow off. Mm. Um, that night we went to the market and just explored. It got extremely cold. So I thought I was going to die of hypothermia that night. So there was that. We took a Tuscany trip the next day, 12 hours in a car in the back roads going around these tiny little roads. I thought I was going to die by flying off the edge. Of, of said road. However, our driver, Alessandro, was awesome. Uh, we went to this little town called uh, Pienta, which if you're going to be in, in Tuscany, that's the way to go. I love Pienta. It's great. You weren't in one of those tiny little European cars, were you? <laughs> Could you imagine big in, in a tiny little <laughs> European car? Tiny little, like, Everywhere we went, I don't know what it was. Yeah, the clown cars. Do, 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 do. Um, no. <clears throat> in fact, everywhere we went, we were in a Mercedes or a BMW. I don't know how that happened, but we ended mm. up doing that. It was crazy. Um, and then, um, then so we did that. The next day was Adventure Day where we got lost. Um, didn't know what was going on. We didn't know how we were going to get anywhere, but we got lost. on a. We took a bus to this town and dropped us off. And then the other bus, we didn't make it. So we got lost that day. I thought I was going to die there. Uh, and then the last day, we went to go see the Statue of David. The Duomo uh, walked another crap ton getting back to the train station and back to our hotel in Rome. Uh, it was a, it was a tough road. So Biggin walked everywhere. It was insane. Wow. There was there wasn't a lot of Ubers uh, in in Florence, so there's a lot of walking. Taxis were insanely expensive. So that was fun. It Sounds was, terrible. It was, yeah, terrible trip. That's what I heard. <laughs> it was it just, I thought I was going to die everywhere I went. 
I'm like, oh, you it's a just thinner. a quick. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's so it's having to walk everywhere. It's like double right. wavy. Yeah. You walk 12 yeah, miles it, and eat five pounds of pasta like, when you're done, right? Like, I'm back 10 pounds okay. lighter. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, we're in the hotel room and we're like, oh, there's gelato 0.2 miles away. And I'm like, hell, no, I ain't walking 0.2 miles. <laughs> Cause everywhere it was a quick five minute walk, but we get lost cause we couldn't get there. It was like 15 turns you got to make. And then we're like, I don't know. So we quit and went back. So it was miserable, but overall <laughs> it was a great experience. I love it. I would encourage you. Rome is fantastic. Uh, Florence. I just, I got lost all the time. Google maps was not, not happy with me. Um, but it was, it was awesome. I'm glad we got to do it. Um, would highly recommend it again. And I'm so excited the day, uh, Brian, you picked us up from the airport. The next mm-hmm. day, I was making pasta already. I was like, yeah. bada, bada, bada. "This is going to be great." So it uh, it was a great experience. So awesome, fun times. Mm-hmm. All right, so we have our guest, uh, uh, Jeff Holsclaw. He is on the line. Let me get a little bit of water because I'm choking. All right, you got it. <laughs> Or some wine. Maybe it was wine. So we'll bring uh, we'll bring Jeff on. All right, you ready? Let's do it. And now our feature presentation. Ah, that's the wrong button. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we're if nothing else, we're professional. We know what we're doing. I've never had like a a sound bumper to introduce me, so this is great. Oh, wow. So we're your first sound bumper. Congratulations, guys. We did it. (laughs) Jeff, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. Can you hear me and everything? You're perfect, man. I appreciate you coming on. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I um, binge watched your video. So I feel like it's been all day with Jeff. So that's been great. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry about that. No, 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 no. It's been great. And so we're kicking off a new series called In the Pursuit of Deconstructing Faith. And, uh, you know, deconstruction in, in Christianity has been kicked around a whole lot uh, recently. It seems like all of a sudden it got super popular. And um, <clears throat> at least for me, for you, you've been doing this thing for a while. So can you maybe tell us your story, how you got started? Like, and what is deconstruction? Because you're the first one out of the gate. So uh, maybe bring people up to speed on deconstruction of faith and Christianity. Oh, wow. No pressure. Well, for me, um, okay, well, what is, we'll kind of go to uh, what is deconstruction. We'll kind of come back around to my fifth thing, I guess, is um, like originally, you know, I studied philosophy in my undergrad um, for my bachelor's and um, we read a lot of like deconstructive texts like Derrida and Foucault and uh, other people. And it was mainly this, uh, this idea that, you know, all meaning kind of, uh, falls apart that, you know, if you read a text, or if you read a story, if you watch a movie, that the meaning that the the author is trying to convey, uh, when you look at it closely enough, it, it always kind of falls apart. It doesn't accomplish its goal and things like that. And so Derrida showed how that was true for, um, for texts, for reading and Foucault and other people showed how that was true for power relationships and your pursuits of truth. And, you know, this kind of goes all the way back to Nietzsche and uh, Freud and and all these different kinds of people. And so that's kind of how I came into the world of deconstruction was with this real Mm. philosophical kind of use. And especially back, you know, 20 plus years with the emerging church and things like that, there was uh, kind of that philosophical use, you know, that people Mm -hmm. were kind of questioning faith and moving out of this like really constrained evangelicalism. Uh, And I loved all that stuff. And I think there's a lot of good work and a lot of good things that are in there. Uh, But now it feels like deconstruction is not actually that as much. It feels like deconstruction is more of a catch all for some philosophical questioning, for some church burnout, for some, like it's just church anger or church disappointment. I think there's a lot of like, um, I, I talk about these like three D's of deconstruction, what leads people into it. And I think some of it is like just problems with the Bible. Like, I just don't understand how to read the Bible. You know, is it creation in six days? Did dinosaurs, you know, get on the ark? And so it's all these questions. Like there's just this disconnect with the Bible. Uh, I think there's a lot of disillusionment with like politics. Uh, I know mm-hmm. a lot of people from my church, uh, not because of anything our local church did, 
but basically it was like people saying like, I can't believe literally this is what they'd say. I can't believe my parents go to a church that would do X, Y, and Z. And so I'm just going to forget all churches. And so there's a lot of this wow. like kind of angst around kind of what other Christian people are doing. Um, I think a main one uh, that kind of I experienced is kind of um, like emotional distress, like there's trauma or there's abuse and people have not been given resources in Christianity that can deal with that in, like in a real, in a non, like, let's just stuff it and forget it kind of way. So I think mm -hmm. deconstruction now just kind of gathers all that stuff together and people are just like, I'm having a faith crisis. I'm deconstructing faith. And so now for some people, it's like this real, it's like this valiant, like standard that they pick up, and, you know, they wave it. Uh, and for other people, it's a really kind of quiet and private kind of thing. Uh, and it causes a lot of turmoil, right? So it's just, it's just kind of all over the place. And you're right. I don't know what tipped it off a couple years ago, but everyone's talking about it now. So, yeah. Uh, we have a side, <clears throat> a side chat and magic man just uh, typed in emotional damage from, <laughs> from TikTok, and, and yeah, it, it does feel like, uh, especially in, in, um, uh, like rural churches that, um, that dealing with emotions and therapy and that kind of stuff just really isn't highly regarded. And it's almost some woo woo stuff that you kind of put away and you stuff those feelings down and you just deal with it. And, and I, I completely agree. Like that's going to do trauma and damage. And especially when the church doesn't have those resources to deal with people like that, then, then what do you do? And it makes a whole lot of sense. Well, I think too, there's just, um, you know, like in this, in the eighties, when this word deconstruction came around, you know, like the internet wasn't there. You didn't have <laughs> sure. kind of perpetual talk show news. Uh, and you get that with like cable news, you know, in the nineties, and then you get the internet in the nineties and uh, certainly the two, you know, early two thousands. Uh, and so there's just this explosion of information. And I think our culture has changed so much that now, uh, what goes by deconstruction is people just admitting, like, I don't really believe I never really did. Mm. So you know, so I think a lot of people are just falling away from faith, you know, the nuns and the duns and things like that. Uh, and so that all just kind of gets, it's all grouped in with deconstruction on. And so, so like as a pastor and as a professor, like I understand all those cultural forces, but then I also, I grieve because I feel like people are rejecting, oftentimes people are rejecting a really shallow and superficial version of Christianity or faith in the mm -hmm. first place. Uh, and then they think that that's what their only option. Well, I could either believe this flim flammy kind of thing, uh, or I'll just ditch it all. And it's like, well, or I'll become, you know, maybe we don't want to go there or I'll just kind of like become a progressive liberal Christian. Uh, and for me, those are mm. not great, great options. Like I'll be a fundamentalist, you know, <laughs> so anyway, the baby out with the bathwater, right? <clears throat> right. For sure. Yeah. It's. <clears throat> And you kind of burst my bubble a little bit. You said that you had been <clears throat> doing this for about 20 years. And I was like, man, that's a long time. <clears throat> and then I realized the first time I read like Rob Bell was about 20 years ago. And I'm like, good night. I'm so old. <laughs> and, and the I, thought, I think, go ahead. I was just saying, I have these, I'm old thoughts a lot now, which is not <laughs> my, my recently today was, uh, I think that 10 years ago, wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Anyway, <laughs> I do uh, health and welfare benefits and <clears throat> I was trying to find a test participant and uh, I was like, well, I got to find somebody semi old. And then, uh, you know, and then I look and I was like, you know, 2000, 2000, like, is their birth year? Like they've got to be babies. And I'm like, no, they're not that, you know? So yeah, I totally get it. every day. I'm in, you know, faced with the fact of 1977 was <clears throat> quite a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, and so I, I brought up Rob Bell because I thought it was important. I think one of the first times that I really got introduced to questioning the gospel was Velvet Elvis and the mm -hmm. question of what if, what if Mary, uh, or what if Jesus had a kid, would your entire faith crumble? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't, we don't see any context that he did, but if that happened, would it, would it collapse? And I've always wrestled with, like, what are the things that, you know, that <clears throat> that are kind of like that? And how do people, how would you explain to people, like, it's okay to wrestle with those questions? Like, because especially coming up from a Southern Baptist church, we 
constantly got inundated with this is how it is and don't question and it's going to be how it's going to be. And if you question that, then it's, you know, not any good or like something's wrong with you. So how do you process and change and shift that to it's okay to question, it's okay to um, doubt, it's okay to have a faith journey that's not shallow? Yeah, no, that, that, those are great questions. And I think questions like that, you know, and uh, someone like Pete Enns, biblical scholar, he likes to ask those kind of questions too. And I, I think that um, it's really good. I, I just posted today about wrestling with God. And I said, you know, if you don't, or it was yesterday, maybe on Facebook, if you're not wrestling with God, you know, you're not following <laughs> Jesus, right? You know, and some people got upset and other people were like, yeah, exactly. But I, I see that that's what was really helpful for me is early on um, in my faith journey, um, I was given this book on, uh, was it the cel- not the Celebration of Disciplines? It was one of these Richard Foster books, you know, and I I, I stumbled ac- across uh, St. John of the Cross, uh, where he talks about the dark night of the soul, you know, and it just kind of mm-hmm. blew up my understanding of like, oh, so you can like struggle and wrestle with God and not know where God is mm-hmm. for extended periods of your faith journey. And I read a lot of philosophy too, uh, and when you read a little philosophy, you think, oh, there's answers that are out there. When you read lots of philosophy, you're like, oh, people don't really have many answers. Like there's just lots of questions. And so my horizon pretty quickly, I was raised fundamentalist, um, but pretty quickly my horizon was kind of um, opened quite a bit. And, and so that helps kind of get us out of this certainty seeking kind of um pursuit, which I think is a very modern kind of thing. So Descartes, you know, he kind of starts off modern philosophy with, I think, therefore I am, but really his method was, I doubt, therefore I am. I'm going to doubt everything that could possibly exist until I find the one thing that I don't think Mm. I could doubt. Um, and that's thinking itself because doubting is a type of thinking. So thinking, so I think therefore I am right. But his whole method is doubting and it's aimed at finding rock solid certainty. And so that search for certainty could be very problematic. Um, especially when we're dealing with something called faith, right? And right, so, exactly. and that, and that leads to usually kind of making the Bible like the foundation of all of our certainty. And so therefore you can't ever question, you can't ever wrestle with any of these things, because if you're doing that, then you're not being faithful to the Bible. If we're not faithful to the Bible, then we've lost all certainty. And if we've lost all certainty, then what the heck are we doing? You know, and I've heard people say like, if the ax hammer, you know, and whatever didn't float on the water, then Jesus was not raised from the dead. You know, it's kind of like everything is equivalent <laughs> in the Bible. And I just, I don't think that's true. So yes, I think we should wrestle with, um, these questions, but, but I get concerned, you know, with Rob Bell or Pete Enns and others, because they just want to revel in the questions and mm. that actually becomes its own kind of skepticism. And those things aren't actually that far seeking certainty and reveling mm. in skepticism is actually still part of the Cartesian let's doubt everything kind of method. Uh, and okay. so I think that, um, while I do want to encourage people to kind of explore faith and to, um, question things and to wrestle with them, you know, I want to kind of also encourage people like, make sure you're, you're not just reading all the the skeptic people because they're just going to kind of put you down a a certain path. And actually the church has wrestled with these questions a long time. Like people are shocked when you find out that origin and Augustine and all these church fathers, none of them thought that six day creation was what Genesis one was talking about. You know, people are like, really? People have thought these things for a millennia? And it's like, yes. Pe- you know, so there's lots of resources in the broad Christian tradition for really grappling with this stuff. Uh, and so that's where I want the skepticism to jump in, but it just can't be the whole thing. And that's where I think sometimes deconstruction is like, you know, becomes problematic. So, yeah. Yeah. I've heard it <clears throat> said like, you've got to, <clears throat> excuse me, you can question your faith, but you've got to, before you question that, you've got to at least have some type of anchor mm-hmm. and this person, their anchor is, is God. And that's, that's final. That's never going to change, <clears throat> but we can wrestle with the other things around that. Um, so right. I thought, you right. know, at least have an anchor. I think that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I always go to the Psalms um, and say, well, you know, people are questioning faith in the Psalms. Like you can't read very many Psalms all in a row. Uh, and not see people kind of sure. mad at God, disappointed with God, questioning God. Uh, like it's all there. You know, I was raised, like I said, fundamentalist, right? So we only had like, you know, Psalm 52, make sure to confess your sins. Psalm 2, that's mm-hmm. about Jesus. And, and we don't really read the rest, right? <laughs> you know, but 
when you read them, you see that people are, are struggling with God, but what are they doing? They're bringing their complaints to God. Like they're still talking to God about what's going mm. on. And so that's what I always want, you know, mm. and then like bring those complaints to God. Like he can handle, that's what I always tell people. Like God can handle all your emotions. God can handle all your questions. Like let's keep bringing them to God. Yeah. You think about Job and it wasn't, he, he, Job was constantly was questioning God and he's like, you know, I love you, but here's, here's really the big picture of, of everything. It wasn't a smote him down or smite him down. <clears throat> it was just a relationship. And I think that that's, that's such a key thing is, is it's not, it's not just a, a go to church on Sunday and Wednesday or, <clears throat> you know, whatever, but like, it's a relationship with God and, and you have ups and downs and, I have ups and downs with my wife. I question my wife. My wife questions me. It, it is that back and forth and back and forth. And that's where I think true Christianity and, and relationships are where it is, is in that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, what you said there is really important. Or like relationships have to do with people and mm. information has to do with like science and facts and these types of things. Not that there isn't facts about God and facts about your relationship. You know, I've been married 22 years, you know, and these types of things, right? So there's certain facts about relationships, but relationships uh, and people, they require a different way of relating. And I feel mm. that sometimes when people enter into a certain kind of deconstructive frame of mind is it's still part of that you know, Cartesian modern philosophy model, which is I need to find the facts about all this stuff. I need to find out all the facts mm -hmm. about the Bible. I need to find out all the facts about God and, you know, all, all this stuff, right? It's all becomes facts. But the truth is, is, you know, relationships and people, they're, they're formed through stories, they're formed through the give and take of an interaction. And that's why most of the Bible <laughs> is in story form, right? Because that's how yeah. you learn about a person as you tell stories about people. Like if you just, you know, if you said, well, Jeff Holsclaw, he weighs this much and he was born on this date and he's this tall, you know, it's like, well, you wouldn't really feel like you knew me if you got all those right. facts, right? Right. You'd have to yeah. hear stories about me. You'd have to build your own interactions with me. You'd get to know my friends and my kids and my wife. And they, so that's where, like, just what you said, like if we're on a deconstructive journey, um, are we still pressing into the relationship? And I, uh, I, I don't know if you saw it, but like I had a couple posts uh, a while ago about uh, the road to Emmaus being kind of like a deconstructive story. Like Jesus was mm. always with those two disciples in the midst of their disappointment, in their midst of literally walking away from the scene, <laughs> you know, the church, right? They're walking away from the other disciples. They're just going home. Like I'm going back to my normal life because this was all a bunch of you know, crap. And, you know, they're disappointed. They're angry. They're probably angry. They're, you know, their eyes are downcast and they don't recognize that Jesus is right there with them. Um, mm -hmm. but, but God is still there with them, you know, and Jesus even walks with them for a while in the wrong direction, walks with them. And I just think that's a beautiful kind of picture of how, mm -hmm. you know, a good way of, of this deconstructive process, like they complain, they, uh, they admit that they're upset. Jesus, you know, but then Jesus starts talking to them and Jesus starts asking questions and then Jesus sits down and has a meal with them. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait, something, <laughs> something is happening. Right. And then they go back. Yeah. And so I, I see that kind of as a, at least for me, what I hope for people like on their deconstructive journeys that they would see that Jesus is walking with them in that. But I think sometimes, yeah. you know, they're, they're measuring the distance. Well, we have gone this far away from, from uh, Jerusalem and here are the names of the people that killed Jesus. And here are the disciples that just don't get it. And they don't understand how I feel. They're not, they're, they're not um, affirming how much I'm disappointed with these types of things, you know, uh, right. Those are, those are all facts and those are true, but you know, maybe we're kind of missing something. Yeah. And it's important to look at, uh, context and important to look at different points of view. Most of the time when we hear the story, and I was in, in Bible study, so I'm not taking credit for this one, but uh, when we read the story of Moses and Pharaoh, we put ourselves in the context of Moses, like, oh, we're, we're you know, we're trying to be the faithful servant. We're trying to do what God wants us to do and, and you know, be faithful to him. But really, sometimes we're Pharaoh and it's like we're stubborn and we don't get it and we oppress people. And if we are able to to take our normal heroic person that we try to identify with and maybe shift it to somebody else, maybe we're not Peter, maybe we're Judas, you know, and and look at and put our, our feet, 
in somebody else's shoes, then, you know, it, that also helps open it up and really make scripture more alive because we can identify with so many of those people uh, in different contexts if we just allow ourselves to do so. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, in talking about kind of going back and forth and not hitting the measurement, you talked about on your video about tacking and sailing. Maybe you can explain that because I thought that was a beautiful analogy as well. Yeah, sure. Well, so it has this idea with like wind and uh, headwinds and tailwinds. So like when you're on a, on a hike or when you're uh, this is a, like a metaphor for life. When you're on a hike, you know, and you're on a certain side of the mountain, like the wind is blowing at your back and it's kind of cool and refreshing and it's kind of pushing you along. Uh, or if you're in like a car, right, you're getting saving the gas mileage, which we're all very concerned about right now, uh, cheap gas and things like that. Right. So the, 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 the tailwinds, the winds at your back, you don't notice, but they're helping you. But then when you mm -hmm. turn, like you're hiking and you turn around a corner and then those winds are in your face then there's resistance and then you notice it all of a sudden you're like ah something wrong is wrong here uh you know and then you have to do all sorts of different things and so i think a lot of times like this move for people you know at the beginning of their faith journey whether they're in a good community they're just like vibrant in faith like god is ministering to them uh they're overcoming you know whatever it is addictions bad habits bad relationships right so they're just feeling all this grace and energy and kind of life uh but then you know things happen right you come down the mountain these types of things and you start hitting these these headwinds. And I think there is kind of this lack of discipleship, you know, for a lot of people to kind of help them prepare for that. And then, it, you know, if that goes on too long, or, or there's these other disappointments with the church that are broader, then it becomes a full on like faith crisis or deconstruction moment. But uh, so I have this like idea, this metaphor for uh, our journey of faith, which is basically you know, sailing, it came to me because I was, uh, we were out sailing on those little catamarans and I tipped one over twice with my wife and, you know, we totally wiped out. Right. And I was like, Oh, this is a, this is a good faith example. So, you know, when we're sailing and the winds are at our back, then we can see clearly where we're going. And it's really easy to get there when the, when the wind is at our back and we're in a boat, but when you have a headwind, how do you keep moving forward to your goal or the object? What, however you call it, you know, life in, in Christ, you know, things like that mm -hmm. salvation. So it is possible to sail into the wind. You just can't sail directly into the wind. And what do you do? You go at 45 degree angles, kind of one way, and then you kind of turn the boat around and you go the other way. And it's called tacking where you're actually kind of zigzagging slowly toward your goal. But the problem is, uh, is you actually have your back to where you're going because the way that the boat is oriented is you're not actually looking as clearly where you're going because you have to catch the wind in a certain way. And so it, it can be very disorienting. And I think this is kind of an example for um, the times when we're deconstructing faith is we actually have to tack back and forth. And so part of it is uh, asking these questions maybe that uh, you were talking about. Like we have to ask different questions and we have to understand that we have to kind of zigzag on our way toward God. The problem comes if you don't ever zag, like you just zig, right? You, you you never actually get where you're going if you just kind of start sailing off at a 45 deg degree angle, because after a little while, you'll just kind of miss your target altogether. You don't turn around. And so I think a lot of times in our deconstructive journeys, we don't kind of zig and zag. We kind of either go from mm -hmm. fundamentalism that maybe is a certainty seeking faith. So we'll just take the Bible, for example. We'll, we'll kind of go from, you know, and I don't know how you guys talk about the Bible on the podcast and whatnot, but we'll just say this like very fundamentalist, inerrancy. There's, uh, you read the Bible literally, every single word of the Bible is inspired by God and it's perfectly true. And we have to, you know, love every single bit of it. Uh, and you move from that and you kind of go to this questioning phase. Uh, but then if you just go in one direction for too long, it, you basically lose the Bible. You become like, you know, mm -hmm. progressive liberal where the Bible is just kind of inspired words of other humans who kind of are grap grasping after this God, you know, but, but who knows if they got it right. And we're, we're trying to put into words as much as they are, what our experience is with God. And, and all these words are all just a jumbled mess. And so there's no authority. There's no actual God spoke to us. There's just people trying to, you know, figure out some experience they had. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of go off too far in one direction. And I actually think that the church has good resources that basically turn the way you turn back is you say, well, we're not actually focusing on the Bible. We focus on Jesus. Jesus is the true word of mm. God that, you know, you look at John 1 14 or John 1 1 and John 1 14 and the 
beginning of the book of Hebrews, right? So you build up kind of a, a better doctrine of scripture that isn't based on modern certainty seeking. And you start kind of zagging back and forth, you know, like, so we have the word of God, but we have the person Jesus, and we have to keep going back and forth between those two things. Another example would be, I think a lot of kind of fundamentalist kind of churches are very intellectual driven. So it's all about the doctrine and it's all about getting the right doctrine. If you, so you brought up early on, like, what if Jesus had a kid or can we question the virgin birth? You know, that was a big thing for Rob Bell too. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like, do we have, you know, in the fundamentals are like, Oh my gosh, you can't question any of these things. You'll lose all faith. You know? Uh, and well, maybe, right. So you start, so it's all very cognitive, but I know a lot of people then mm -hmm. who didn't become their faith journey is very emotive. So it's all just about emotions, it's about feelings. And it's just about how I feel about God. And there doesn't have to be any doctrines connected to that at all. Like Jesus doesn't need to be God and the Holy spirit could be whatever. And the Bible doesn't really matter. I'll just pray and maybe go on a walk or something like that. Right. So it just all becomes so experiential and so, um, emotional yeah. that you kind of just end up not reaching your target, at least in my opinion. Right. So we need to actually have this tacking back and forth in the headwinds of kind of a difficult faith, you know, well, we need, we do need the intellectual aspect of faith. And I think there's good grounds for, you know, certain core doctrines of sure. Christianity, but then we also need to be true and honest about our emotional lives. And the truth is, is Christianity has ample resources for dealing with our emotional lives and our experiential lives, the gift of the Holy spirit and these types of things. So we need to keep tacking between these two kind of poles. Um, it's the same thing with walking, right? Walking is just putting one yeah, foot sure. balancing and then, you know, so. Anyhow, that was probably too much, but there we go. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, you have like five fundamental shifts, and you mentioned kind of two of them. The the one that I really want to get at is four and five. Um, the, uh -oh. the fourth one. <laughs> I know what those are. <laughs> yeah, but I think that there, gosh, there's so much meat in that, and it's so perfect. Um, can you go over those those two? Because oh, I love those. How long do we have? Uh, as long as you want. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, so, yeah, I talk about how we need to kind of move from a really kind of narrow um, understanding of the atonement. So shifting from mm -hmm. penal substitution to victorious union with God. That sounds like, you know, big, heady words. You know, I teach theology. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. So penal substitution is just this idea that uh, if we boil it down, um, that you know, I've sinned, uh, the penalty of sin that God has decided is death. Um, you know, God is just, so God has to mete out that punishment in some way, but God also kind of loves me. I think he loves his creation. So he wants to find an alternative. So instead, you know, in the old Testament, there were sacrifices that died in my place. And then, uh, ultimately Jesus came and died so that I wouldn't have to die so that he takes my death and I get his life instead. So there's a penalty and there's a substitution. So this is penal substitutionary atonement. And I think that there's aspects to that, which are true in the biblical story. Mm -hmm. What I'm right. concerned about or disagree with is that that is what some, you know, theologians and some churches will say that is either the only aspect of the gospel or it's the most important one. And I'm not sure that that is actually true. I feel like that's a very subordinate kind of lower yeah. side of the truth. And so I would say that actually kind of, it seems to me that, that the broader story is union with God. And so if you start with Genesis one and two, humanity was created in God's image. And mm -hmm. uh, in Genesis two speaks about this place that was created so that God and humanity could dwell together. And I kind of argue not just me, right? But you know, a bunch of people would say, well, all of creation was meant to be this place where heaven and earth, where humanity and God would dwell together. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of the story. And then the end of the story is Revelation uh, 21 and, and 22, where you get the new heavens and the new earth coming down and there's a union between heaven and earth again. And so like the main point of this whole story is union with God. And you get this mm -hmm. all throughout scripture. So that's my first point. And then the second one would be, uh, victory is that jesus actually has the victory over sin sin and death over spiritual powers and principalities however you might think about that uh and so jesus actually his death and resurrection is actually like a victorious campaign against all the forces of death and there is a substitution that happens in there but that's kind of like a minor moment and the reason why uh myself and a bunch of other people argue this is 
is just to point out, well, when did Jesus die? He died on the festival of Passover. And the festival of Passover was when Israel, you know, was freed from slavery. And there was this victory over Pharaoh, you know, the reigning world superpower at the time. Mm -hmm. God led the people out of slavery uh, and had victory over those spiritual forces and political forces and enslaving forces. And so this is, had always been a very political uh, celebration for the people of Israel. And that's why uh, the Roman officials like the uh, Pontius Pilate uh, were always a little on edge during Passover because it's kind of the, mm -hmm. you know, if we're going to rebel, we'll rebel during, <laughs> this is the, time. Yeah. during the Passover, right? Uh, and so it's interesting that Jesus, um, you know, I believe he's God. So I believe he could do anything he wanted at any time. And I believe that he could have died in the, you know, when he most needed to. And so mm -hmm. he ended up dying for our sins. According to the scripture, he ended up dying to liberate us from sin and death on Passover. <clears throat> now, and I would say if the penal substitutionary story or theory was the absolute heart of the gospel. Why didn't Jesus somehow manufacture dying on the day of atonement, which would have been a couple months later? Uh, Cause that is kind of this idea, you know, you get this idea of sacrifices of, of blood cleansing things. You know, you actually get the high priest uh, confessing all the sins of the people on the animal mm -hmm. before it gets killed. Right. So it's, this, it's, it's clearly, you know, death in order to forgive sins. Uh, but Jesus didn't die on the day of atonement. He died, um, on a time when Israel would normally celebrate victory over enslaving forces or victory over, you know, spiritual domination and things like that. So anyways, uh, I could go on and on and on about all these types of things, uh, but that's the, the short version. So, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> I and, go on and, and on. on. And, and guys chime in if, if anybody wants to, to say anything else on that, but I, I, I agree with that in the fact of, I, I think so many Christians and in, in churches will just teach the the penal substitution and just say, oh well, you're you're a sinner, but God did it all, um, and there's no there's no victory that's that's celebrated. Like we're free, we're done with that. It's just, oh yeah, you're still a sinner or you sin and blah blah blah. But there's no there's no celebration. There's no we're out of these chains and we get stuck in the discipleship and, or not the lack of discipleship. And we still have this mentality of, yeah, God did it all, but I'm still a sinner and I'm still a bad person. While on the other hand, what you're saying is that's been wiped clean and we're done and we can move forward. And I think for a lot of Christianity, especially American Christianity, it's, it's, you're still a bad person. It's still, you're still mm -hmm. bad. And there's no freedom in that. And I think that's a huge thing is what about the freedom? Christ came to give us freedom, not keep us there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say for someone who I meet who is dealing clearly with remorse and guilt for the actions mm. that they have done, you know, the penal substitutionary kind of aspect of the gospel is something I'd want to share with them. Hey, yeah, mm, you blew absolutely. it. You blew it. Like, you know, and not only have you brought destruction on yourself and maybe some other people in your life, you know, but, but God cares about this. Like, in, there's a big problem. Right. But I think, and so there are people who struggle with that and you need to, you know, share that. And at some point in the discipleship process, you always need to bring that up. Right. But I think right. like an on-ramp for more people is this idea of being captive to sin um, or having some sort of power that they feel is upon them, whether it's an addiction or whether it's uh, like surviving an abuse or whether mm -hmm. it's just like bad relationships or being teased and picked on. Right. And so there's all sorts of things that happen in people's lives that where they feel like, yeah, I may be sin. So I contribute to the world of sin, but I've been sinned against. And that sin against me is now uh, stuck in my body, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, trauma or abuse, physical scars or emotional scars. Like it's, I react sinfully because I've been sinned against. Right. And so they feel mm -hmm. like um, a prisoner to these types of things. Right. And if you just come at them with like, yeah, 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 you've had a bad life, but you're a sinner, you know, that doesn't really <laughs> give them the lip that doesn't liberate them. And I think Jesus came to deliver, you know, he came to set the captives yeah. free. And, so, and then conversely, or it's usually together as people who are suffered abuse or trauma or different kinds of things. 
they they have no sense of belonging. Uh, maybe they come literally from bad families or maybe just uh, neglectful families. And I think the gospel of union with God or uh, being joined into the family of God, I say this to people all the time. I am so sorry that your family life sucks so bad mm-hmm. or that your single mom is just hanging on there and that you don't know who your dad is. Like that is horrible. And yeah. God wants to be your father right now. And Jesus made it possible for that to happen, you know, and then you, right. And at some point you you get back to the substitutionary atonement and you need to let them know, Hey, like, bro, you still do bad things. Like you need to stop it. Right. (laughs) Right. But you know, for people who don't have dads or people who have, you know, or even parents who have died. And like, I think the gospel needs to be big enough to cop to comprehend like difficult family lives, um, you know, substance, abuse and and moral failure right we need like all that and so that's where i think like the victorious union kind of model uh becomes big enough to be good news to people where they are uh whereas the penal substitutionary model um sometimes it feels like you have to argue them into bad news so that then you can share the good news meanwhile there's other parts of their life where they already know it's bad news you know and and they want to hear good news so so (laughs) yeah yeah, I remember as a kid <clears throat> for a youth group, we would go to the houses. We would it a mission trip and we'd go knock on doors. And the first thing we would say is, uh, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? Like, I mean, who does that? <laughs> like, that's not okay. I'm just yeah. trying to watch the game and, and eat a sub. Like, why are you coming at me like that, bro? So, yeah, no, I, it, the last one that you talked about on the, co- on the, on the shifting, though, you said from culture war to sin into the world. Mm -hmm. And you made a point that uh, Jesus lost the political battle, but he won the spiritual war while uh, Christianity, American Christianity seems like they want to win the political battle, but uh, lose the spiritual war. And that one dug deep um, because you see it so much um, in in the church. Now it's, it's, we got to win this political battle. We got to make everybody Christian just by our morals. And that's not going to work. Mm, yeah. Well, I think that goes back to the what I talked about earlier about the legacy of modernity and certainty seeking and things like that, where, um, you know, we feel like if we just proclaim truth at people, that they'll be convinced by it. Uh, mm-hmm. Because, you know, just stating the facts will convince everybody. And, you know, the truth is that, you know, that rarely works, right? <laughs> Have you ever been a fight? in your marriage or with your kids, like just laying out exactly what happened usually doesn't resolve things. You know, I'm constantly surprised that that doesn't work. Right. Because there's like, there's there's this heart issue. And I I think a lot of times uh, two things. So one is about truth. And then one is about power is Mm. we're not, when it comes to truth is the new Testament never says that we're, responsible for convincing other people about the truth of anything, right? That's Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit's job. Uh, Was that John 16? It's either 14, 15 or 16. It's right in there, right? The Holy Spirit comes to to convict. And so it's the Holy Spirit's job to actually convince people of the truth. We actually don't have to convince people of the truth. What do we do? We just witness to the truth. So we're sent to be witnesses. Hey, I'm just going to tell you what I know and have seen and how I've experienced God and how it changed my life. Uh, and I think that living this way is probably going to change your life too. And it's probably the best thing for you. Well, do you agree yeah. or disagree? I don't know. Um, and so that's one. The second one is about power. And this is, um, for me, when you see how Jesus does or often does not use social or political power, uh, that should be pretty instructive for us uh, as a church. Is You know, when he's with Pilate, you know, he's not you know, he says, you know, if I was here to start a war, like I'd have my, my disciples would raise up and protect me, or I just call down some angels, you know, to wipe you guys out. But that's not like what we're doing here. And so, but, and so his way of enemy love of suffering and witnessing to a different way, um, it did change the world. Um, but I think so often we as Christians, you know, feel like we're responsible to change the world. And that, so we have to be uh, instituting policies in the government and doing these types of things. And I'm not necessarily against some of those things, but I think too often it it feels like, well, we're we're responsible to change or to save or to convince the world to do the right things. 
and that mm-hmm. starts really messing with your head and with your priorities. You know, so I tell people, I am really grateful to be an American citizen. I'm grateful that I can jump on a car and cross multiple state lines without anyone checking my identification. Uh, you know, I'm I'm grateful for all these freedoms, mm-hmm. but I am not invested in making sure this thing called America exists. Like if it stops existing, that would be a hardship for me and all my kids or whatever. But that's not like an eternal kingdom goal is that a mm-hmm. thing called the United States of America would would keep existing. Uh, and so that's where I think a lot of times when it, when it comes to the culture wars, we have this kind of connection between, well, America and Christianity are kind of like they work together and they kind of do work together in, in some ways, but they're kind of not working together in other ways. <laughs> right. and, and there's like, there's a whole 20th century thing. It's actually with this, you know, and I'm, I don't know when this, this is airing live. I don't know when the podcast is going out, but like with this whole, you know, war with, with Russia, the Ukraine mm-hmm. and the cold war, this goes back, you know, over a hundred years when the communist uprising world war one and world war two, you have this strong sense that, I as an American, so say I was raised in the fifties, I as an American am also a Christian and I'm also a capitalist. There's this holy trifecta of being a Christian American capitalist. And we stand opposed to the communist atheist Russians, you know? Mm. And, and, so, and so we, there's like multiple generations of Christians, you know, who are getting old now, but you know, we kind of pass it down who have this sense of like, no, like yeah. to be for capitalism and to be, for America is the Christian thing to do. And it creates oh. these cultural war anxieties uh, that I think we're still kind of living out of. It's it's changed like after the Cold War, then the Iraq War, and now, the, now it's mostly just liberals and conservatives yelling at each other and feeling like <laughs> they're rooting, you know. So it just goes on. But the cultural war mentality, uh, it feels like they're responsible. We're responsible for how history turns out. But the truth is, and this goes back to the victorious union is no, Jesus is responsible for how Chris, how mm-hmm. the world is going to turn out. And we need to do our best to witness to the truth and to live a life that uses power a little differently, which means I use it to serve other people. I don't use it to serve myself. And so my rights, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too far afield for you, but like my rights sure, are not, are not my main concern. And so yeah. the bill of rights or the rights that maybe, you know, with COVID and all these types of things, right. I don't think that as a Christian, my main concern should be what rights I do or do not have, because I have a duty to love God and to love others. Uh, and mm-hmm. so that's where I think we kind of, uh, we kind of lose the, the thread, the plot of the story of following Jesus Absolutely. is, you know, he handled truth differently and he handled power differently. And I think our culture war mentality kind of gets both those things wrong. So we need to be sent as witnesses. And if we're successful, then great. And if we fail, you know, and and are killed like the early disciples, then so be it. (laughs) Right. All right. So we've got a couple of questions from our guests. Um, So the first one is from a um, a director. He makes uh, faith-based films. So a lot of these questions, all these questions are going to be dealing with your thoughts on faith-based films. Uh, So do you watch faith-based movies is number one. It's okay to say no. Oops. Sorry. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Yep. Okay. Uh, So my computer, Uh, I don't uh, personally watch a lot of faith-based films. Not that I have anything against them. I just, don't watch them. Uh, and, and I, I, so, okay. So what's the question exactly? Do I, what do I think about? It? And that, well, I'll, I'll give you all four of them if that helps okay. and then you, you can do that. So how do you feel about faith based, faith based films that deal with violence and have violence in them? So that's mm-hmm. the next one. The next one is, do you believe that faith based movies need to capture more what do you believe that faith-based movies need to do to capture more audience? And the last one is, do you believe that the faith-based films can really make an impact in today's society? So I can read those over if, if that helps. Yeah, no, those are your questions. Actually, I, I think I see them there. So okay. um, I, I think violence is a, <laughs> violence is a part of life um, mm-hmm. for most people throughout most of human society. And so 
we we don't want to glorify violence um but for most people outside of you know kind of the west i suppose you know they see violence, and even within the west right if you're not particularly privileged or within a gated community right so so violence is a fact of life and so to to not address it um would probably be to fall into kind of a an untrue version of christianity i guess sure. uh, how it is that you depict violence um, would be, of course, important, you know, or is it age appropriate and these types of things. Mm. Um, but, you know, the same thing with like sexuality, so, you know, like if you read the book of Ezekiel, uh, that is really graphic. Hey, <laughs> Many buddy. people, if you read the book of Ezekiel, it's like super graphic, it, right? Uh, as far as talking about idolatry and kind of the sensuality of all that stuff. So as far as, yeah. So I, so as a pastor, as a father, you know, as a theologian, you know, I'd say, well, you know, we probably need to grapple with violence in films. Now, uh, the other question of, do I believe that, uh, or how to capture more audience? You know, I have no idea about marketing and those types of things. I think, um, I think faith based movies and music are important. I know they get a bad rap in, you know, ex evangelicals and these types of things. Like it's just this culture. But the truth is, is like we were talking about, um, reality is not all about just ideas. It's about aesthetics. It's about stories and it's about kind of embodied mm -hmm. emotions and these types of things. And that's important for faith. That, that's why there's four gospels, right? We have four early movies about Jesus's <laughs> life, right? We have four, you know, technicolor written documents, you know, about Jesus's life. Why? Because telling the story in that kind of narrative form is, is very important, you know? And so I love, um, the chosen, you know, series, like, I, you know, we showed it to our youth group at our church. Like it's super well done. Um, and, and it tells good stories. And so I, the, so I think faith-based movies would probably capture more audiences by grappling honestly with like, um, the ups and downs of life and of faith with God. Um, yeah. and so, um, and again, I don't watch a lot of faith-based movies, so I can't say whether they do that really well or sure. poorly, but that, that's what I would say. The more that you actually are, um, exposing authentic human life mm. to other people, I think that would be gripping, uh, for people. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one is, um, how will these kind of movies make an impact on society? Well, I think, I think they play an important role in the discipleship kind of life is helping people have stories and narratives. Again, this is why the gospels and a lot of the old Testament are in narrative form. Like it helps shape our imaginations for how to respond in life. You know, and this is why most churches, good preaching always tells stories, right? Because that actually shapes yeah. your imagination. So it'll have a, a an indirect impact on society because hopefully it'll just make Christians better followers of Jesus. As far as like, uh, an evangelistic tool, um, my thoughts are less positive, not because I don't <laughs> think it could be done. I just don't think it'd be as effective. Kind of like you said, you know, knocking on someone's door and talking yeah. about, you know, do you know where you're going to go when you die tonight? Like, um, so I think like creative storytelling, you know, could make an impact. So, yeah. And then our, our last question from our listeners is, have you ever listened to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast? No, I haven't. I'll write that down. Well, unless there it's bad. Go. I mean, <laughs> I heard is it, it good? good. <laughs> All right. I'll check it out. Awesome. I'll definitely check it out. Jeff, where can people find your information? Because we just scratched the surface on the deconstruction piece. Um, there's so much more. Uh, and you have a, a class and, and whatnot. So how can people get a hold of that? If people are struggling or want some help or tools that they need, how do they get a hold of that and you and your books and whatnot? Yeah, if you go to grassrootschristianity.org, uh, that'll kind of push you to kind of a class that talks all about kind of this stuff. I am trying to build out this idea of a grassroots Christianity that um, – is like faith for everyday people, like growing faith just for, mm. you know, not just pastors or not just people who, you know, love philosophy books, but just for, for everyday people. So mm. I'm still building that out. So that's grassroots Christianity, just one word, dot org. Uh, otherwise, you can find me pretty easily on Facebook and Twitter. My name is Jeff Holsclaw, Jeff with a G, G E O F F, Holsclaw. 
Um, so that's pretty straightforward to find me on those things. And then I'll kind of lead you back. My website is Jeffrey net. It's not .com, .net. So yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very Googleable. <laughs> right. Absolutely. We're going to have all your information on our show notes. Oh, so great. all that can be found there as well. If anybody is interested, I would, if, if you're recovering, if you're well, not recovering, but if you're, you know, struggling with your faith, if you've hit that wall and just feel like you, you don't want to deal with Christianity anymore, or, you know, if you just have questions and whatnot, th these three videos that he, he shows was really helpful and impactful uh, about the deconstruction and then you've got a podcast that um, that people can listen to as well. That that is awesome as well. Yeah, that's the Embodied Faith podcast. Mm -hmm. It really talks about like the the connection between like spiritual formation and psychology and neuroscience and these types of things. Wow, that's the nerdy stuff. But it's I dig pretty it. nerdy, I know, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly absolutely. for me, so I can talk with interesting people, and then you know. That's how that's how I started this podcast, or why? Well, right, because if you just call, if you just if you just like email someone and say, "Hey, can we talk for thirty minutes?" I think you're really interesting. They're going to be like, "No," but if you say, "Hey, you want to come on my podcast and we'll talk for three, They're like, "Sure, absolutely." So, yeah. Yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll be continuing to follow you and uh, and sign up for all your stuff, and uh, I look forward to deconstructing and being part of that as well. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. You guys have a good one or have a good one. Wow. Yeah. Right. Wow. How did you take any notes? Did anybody take notes? I will. When I, edit. <laughs> Do I jump off here, am I still on or? Oh yeah. You can jump yeah, you can off. Jump off. You can hang out. Up to you, man. <laughs> you can right. hang out. You can do whatever you want to. <laughs> You're going to start talking about me when I jump <laughs> off. Absolutely. I want, you know, that's right. We can do it. <laughs> Here, I want to kick Ryan out, and we're gonna. I want to ask you a question real quick. Actually, um, let me switch. Are you talking camera. to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Hold on one second. I want to, to kick move the guy, one the little thing out? here. Here, I'm gonna uh, kick him out. Well, there we go. There he goes. <clears throat> He's, he understands. <laughs> what you know, emotional damage? So I was watching. Um, I can see everyone's <laughs> reaction on the on the podcast here when you started talking about the '50s. Like current events, basically, right? With uh, the Christian yeah. slash capitalist slash, uh, I forget what the other one you said. Um, it was Amer Christian American. Christian American, like, values. And that's like, it's 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 also ingrained into, it's Americana, basically, what it is. And everyone yeah. here just went, huh, what? And started paying attention, like, more than they were before <laughs> when you started talking about that. I was like, it is relevant to today a lot Absolutely. with the, with the yeah. Russian stuff. So I thought that, that was that was just a fascinating way to. I haven't thought about it in those terms yet. I guess is what was interesting to me. Yeah, when you yeah. said that. Well, I mean, Christians in America has always been like together, right, from the very beginning, right, all the pilgrims and whatnot. But you know, it, it took a different kind of turn the first and second world war and how it really got played on world events. How we're you know. We're, we are this and we're fighting against that and that's who we are. And then after the cold war that gets lost and then it just becomes liberals and conservatives. Well, the, the conservatives, you know, with these values and these politics are the real Christians, but the liberals are the atheists, right? It just all got transferred to them. So, yeah. and I'm not for being a wishy-washy liberal Christian. I, that bothers me a ton. <laughs> sure. Well, but and, and you mentioned power. I also don't want to be a fundamentalist either. <laughs> You mentioned power, and there was so much of that, the the Christian conservative movement uh, after that, in you know the '80s and whatnot, and Pat Robertson and all those guys just chomp, chomping the bit for all the power and political sway that they had. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Are we still it's all the money, right? Maybe. Yeah, we're still here. We're still, we're still we're oh, still alive. No. Absolutely. Yeah, I gotta watch we're, myself. We ain't scared. No. <laughs> Yeah, we ain't scared. <laughs> Look, we've got deconstructing church, uh, church and faith uh, this series, and then the next one we're, we're going into straight racism in the South. So we're not. Oh, we're, nice. We'll touch it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> this is a warm up. <laughs> this is Good. a warm up for that. So yeah. Good. Well, please send me all the the links and everything, and I can share them uh, when uh, you get finished doing whatever you're going to do with the podcast or whatever. Yeah, we'll post it Monday. Yep. Great. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good one. Yeah. See you. Thanks. Sorry, and Ryan's I, back. Sorry, I had to. 
Make room on the screen. There he is. <laughs> Emotional, damn it. <laughs> He's been waiting for that all night. <laughs> yeah, listen, I I watched, you know, I watched the, his three videos on deconstructing and it really was helpful uh, for me um, and some of the shifts. And it, I feel like I've made some of the shifts, but there's still some other things that, like you were saying, like, yeah, I didn't realize how much we intertwined, you know, how, how that part started of capitalism, America and mm-hmm. the Bible and whatnot. So um, I would encourage you if you guys are, are, you know, struggling on your faith journey and, or just feel like it's like stand still or um, that you want something more real uh, than just, you know, unicorns and rainbows um, in your faith. And you're, you, you realize, and I think everybody gets to the point where like, all this like, oh, Jesus is great and in real life aren't intersecting like like the scriptures are being presented. And you really do have to struggle with your faith and, and wrestle with it. And it's OK. And you do go and zigzag back and forth. And, you know, some days you just are really connected and some days you're not. And that's OK. And I, th- I feel like in uh, American church, you don't get the approval of it's okay to wrestle and, and struggle with that. Right. Cause I don't think it was necessarily, I mean, you read the Bible and it wasn't easy for anybody, right? The yeah. whole thing's about struggle. Right. And it's not any right. different today than it was then. I don't mm-hmm. think, but yeah. it gets portrayed as, you know, all your problems are solved. If you know Jesus, yeah. right. Right. It's not, yeah. it's not that black and white. Just pray about it. Oh, no, that's not going to work. And the prosperity yeah. gospel certainly doesn't help. Uh, well, if you just pray hard enough, God will give it to you. Well, no. it doesn't quite work either, right? Like, didn't the people that followed Jesus the most were like beheaded and tortured and put in jail and killed? Like every one of them. So it, the prosperity gospel at that point loses me. Like mm-hmm. his most his best friends were like hung upside down and beheaded. Yeah, it didn't work out too well for them. So, <laughs> yeah, like y'all. So one of the cool things, though, uh, in Italy is they have, and I didn't know this, but St. Peter's Basilica is actually right on top of where Peter was buried. Oh. I had no idea about that. So where they give communion is right on top of Peter, wow. where it's, and the scriptures are think, pretty clear. It's like, upon this rock, I build my church. I think that was in a Dan was Brown a book I read, maybe. Yeah, right? Angels and demons. <laughs> was it that one? <laughs> yes, because we saw the place where he runs down, and we're like, oh, he died there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's another church that had the chains that Peter were was uh, in, supposedly, uh, while he was in prison. So it's pretty cool to see that. All right, so I'll let you guys go to sleep on that note. <laughs> Sweet dreams. Yeah. (laughs) Try to sleep (laughs) after that one. Well, again, thank you guys for tuning in uh, to the Southern Fried Philosophy Podcast. Did you guys want to add anything else? No. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) And Erin also wins the award for knowing the sign off. She said it last last week. Keep looking up. (laughs) Thanks, guys. We'll